Okay. Those that know me know that only Jim Raby would have me up here in front of all of these people. When Dave and Ellen and the family were working out the schedule for today and the funeral, and we were getting the eulogies and everything lined up, and they told us, okay, you've got three minutes. What do you say in three minutes about a man that was larger than life? Mm -hmm. He was amazing. Jim had told me several times over the years, I think probably starting about his 70th birthday, that Kathy and I were going to represent the female version of his eulogy. And we talked about it a few times, and as only Jim can, uh, there were a few times he told me what I was going to say. <laughs> he told me what I wasn't going to say. But last week, when he was in the hospital, and, and he was struggling, and, and he was tired, and he, uh, he mentioned again, he said, okay, he said, I, I want you and Kathy, y'all are going to be the female, y'all going to represent the females at my funeral. And so I, I looked at him, and, and I was struggling, and I said, Jim, are you really sure that you want me to tell all that I know? <laughs> so he laid there in his bed, and he looked at me for a minute, and he said, well, if you feel good about it. Okay. Well, I guess after he thought about that a few more seconds, he reached his hand out, and I took his hand, and he said, but you be nice. <laughs> So, here it goes. I met Jim, like Kathy and Doug, when I was in my early 20s, about 35, 36 years ago. Um, I was young, inexperienced, working in a college in Atlanta, running the technical side of continuing education. At that time, and still is today, Jim was very well known in the industry, and I would schedule seminars and consulting and, and bring Jim in to do all that. As always, he, you know, he did um, a marvelous job, uh, and even then, Jim in his seminar and his consulting days, he could fill a room very much like today, which is a true testament to the life that he lived and the man that he was. Jim and Dave uh, talked me about 20 years ago into coming to Alabama and playing with them at STI. Um, and as they say, the rest is history. So we'll sort of leave that there. But I want to share with you a few things that Jim taught me. And Kathy mentioned this earlier in, in her comments about Jim. Uh, the first thing that I learned was uh, don't ask for permission. You always just ask for forgiveness after the fact. <laughs> Jim would come in my office and he would tell me that we were going to go buy some new toy, whether it was the newest camera on the market or whatever the toy was. And those of you that know Jim and, and the family, Jim may have been the brains behind the original operation, but Ellen held the purse strings. <laughs> So, and, you know, as is with any company, there were times of feast. There were times of, you know, not so feastiness, as Jim used to call it. So she would spread the word we were not to spend any money. Well, he would come in my office and he'd say, I've been doing some research. That was always my clue that I, we were about to get in trouble. And I said, okay, he said, we're going to go by... And I'm going to use the camera, for example, because I think that was our first escapade. And we're going to go to Rosie's when we get done. 
Okay. And y'all know how much Jim liked to eat. So I'm like, but Jim, uh, Ellen told us not to spend any money. Okay, well, we're just going to ask for forgiveness. It'll be okay. I'll be in the car. I'll have the car ready. <laughs> you, you hurry up and come on. And my office had a window, and if I didn't come on quick enough, he would back the car up to where I could see him outside of my window. And he would honk the horn, or he would gun the motor, whatever. But anyway, it was my clue to hurry up and get out there. So we would go. We would buy whatever the toy was, the camera. We would go eat at Rosie's. And on the way back, he looked over at me, and he said, Ellen's going to be really mad at you. <laughs> Excuse me? She's going to be really mad. Well, what happened to, uh, this was your idea. Was it my idea? I'm like, well, what happened to, we're going to ask for forgiveness? And he said, well, you can ask for forgiveness, but she's still going to be mad at you. So I, I learned very quickly that I needed to uh, deck the cards a little bit more in my favor because he would throw you under the bus. The second thing he taught me was to be passionate and intentional about all that you do. And if he told me once, he told me a hundred times, have a plan. Failing to plan is planning to fail. So I am extremely analytical because of Jim Raby. I think I can plan every minute of every day of everybody's life, mine, STIs, my family's, but it's Jim's fault. So I want everybody that has to deal with me on a daily basis know that. Okay, who is Jim Raby? And remember the part about the asking forgiveness instead of permission? I can't do this in three minutes, and y'all are just going to have to chill and hold on. Okay, who is Jim Raby? He was extremely kind. He was egotistical. I know y'all don't understand that, right? He was benevolent, controversial. He could be extremely funny. He was a family man, he loved his family. He was very thought provoking, and some days he could just be an absolute royal pain. But above all else, he was a Christian, and he was serious about his faith. Jim touched all that he came into contact with, and he tried in every way possible to help those that he met. Every situation was an opportunity to mentor or to teach or to share. People would show up on our doorstep at STI and they may have washed his car, they may have served him in a restaurant, but if he saw potential in them, he would tell them, go to STI, ask for Diana, and she might give you a job. But he wouldn't forget that. I, it may be a week, it may be two weeks before I would see him, and he would always ask me, well, did so-and-so come by? Did so-and-so call? Yes, Jim. Well, what did you think? Okay, well, Jim, they don't know anything about our experience, our industry. They have no experience, and they don't know what they're doing. And he would look at me and he always had a way of just sort of turning his head and sort of honing in or with one eye on you. And he would say, Diane, neither did I when I was a young whippersnapper. But someone gave me a chance and look where we are now. <laughs> Through Jim's example and encouragement, STI has been the launching pad for several young people's careers. They may be at the arsenal, they may be lead engineers, head engineers, whatever, but Jim, what he saw in them gave them an opportunity to be who they are today, and there are so many of them. Jim and I, through the years, had many heated discussions, and we choose to call them discussions and not arguments, over various topics. And I refer back to the controversial and the egotistical traits. His, not mine, right, okay? Just wanna make sure I clarify. Many times our discussions would end with me telling Jim, you have made me madder than three wet hens. 
And he was so disturbed by that. And he would always look at me with this smile on his face. And he'd say, just three, right? Not four. <laughs> and I'm like, no, not four, just three. Okay, well, good. That means that you still love me. Yes, Jim, I do still love you, but I'm mad. Okay, well, I love you. Um, I'm leaving now. You take care of what we just talked about. So that, that was my cue. The discussion was over. I could be mad. I could be madder than three wet hens. As long as it wasn't four, he was okay. He was still loved and he was moving on. But I was to take care of what it was that I had been directed to. Jim loved his family. Many conversations about, uh, we had so many conversations about Ellen and how much he loved her. And he would come in and he would sit down and he'd say, Ellen is so beautiful. Yes, sir. Ellen is so nice. Yes, sir. And if I didn't answer, we would pause. You had to affirm that you heard and that you agreed. And I'd say, yes, sir. And he'd say, and she is so sweet. And I'd say, well, yeah, most days she can be very sweet. He's like, no, every day she's sweet. Okay, yes, sir. And how blessed he was that she was in his life and that God brought her to him. And that's what he always described her as. How beautiful she was, how much he loved her, how sweet she was, and how blessed he was Amen. to have her in his life and as his wife and as the mother of his son. He also expressed how proud he was of David and the job that he was doing at STI. He talked about Dave a lot, how smart he was, how proud he was of him. All the great things that Dave had in store for the company, for STI, for the employees, for the technology, and for the industry. But he handed David his legacy and trusted him to carry it forward and to make it his own. Dave has and will continue to do an awesome job at the helm of STI. Jim would come in my office and he didn't matter what day it was, it didn't matter what month it was, he would walk in the door and sing happy birthday. Now, if you asked him when my birthday was, I'm not even sure he could tell you, but he entered the office every time and he would sing happy birthday. Then he would sing a hymn randomly and in various ones. There wasn't any one particular that he would sing. Sometimes he would stop and want me to sing with him. And sometimes he would want to be the star of his own show and he wanted to sing alone. And if I started singing without being invited to sing, then he would stop and I would know that this was not the day that I was supposed to sing with him. And so I would, I would stop and listen. He would get through singing his hymn. He would always ask me about my family. And for some reason, he would always remind me that I needed to be nice to my husband, Richard. And then the subject would always go to Jesus. And as Doug said, if you knew Jim very much, you knew how much he loved the Lord and how much that relationship meant to him. And Jim would want you to know that he loved the Lord and he knew where he was going. He would often tell me that his time was drawing near and he would talk about that day that there would be no more pain, no more heart issues, no more Parkinson's. He would be with Jesus and then he would always preface I will be with Jesus, and there will be fat worms, <laughs> deep fishing holes, and lots of fish. And then we would talk about one of Jim's favorite verses in the Bible, John 14, 1 through 3. And I want to share that with you now. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you will be also. Jim lived a wonderful life here on this earth in spite of the health, health issues he suffered over the last several years. But Jim knew that his greatest reward was before him. Not behind him, but it was before him. He loved each of you and wants you to be there with him someday. He may or may not share the fat worms. He may or may not share the fishing holes or even the fish. But he will be looking for you to each be there with him someday. Amen. Don't disappoint him. Amen. Thank you. Love you, Jim.